This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 485, recorded on March 16th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. Uh, can you give me a weather report? Briefly, I just came in from the outside, so I can tell you it's a little blustery. The wind's uh, about uh, 10 to 15 miles an hour, blowing from north to south. So it's partial cloudy. It's uh, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and that translates to about... Three or four degrees centigrade, I guess. Yeah, look at that puffy clouds. Yeah, nice. and it's it's actually a, it's a nice day. It's it's not bad. It's not snowing. <laughs> Joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hello. Here today, it's twenty-seven degrees Fahrenheit, minus three Celsius. 20s. Blue sky, not a cloud in it. It's hmm. really nice, wow. sunny. Snow on the ground, Kathy. Uh, little patches. Okay. We have little patches here. We do. As well. We do. And that, is that it for the snow? I think so. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's uh, 36 <laughs> Fahrenheit, 2 Celsius. Wind is um, kind of blustery out of the northwest, 17 gusting, 26. Right. And um, we've got we've got little patches of snow. We were supposed to get slammed with a big blizzard, and we ended up getting three inches. So now it's mostly melted. Right. Every time I hear blustery, I think of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, Dixon. No, a blustery day some, is one of the stories. Okay. I'll, I'll go that. back and read it. I, I forgot that one. You can go now. It's <laughs> And also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, everyone. Um, it sounds like Alan and I have about the same weather. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what the wind speed is, uh, but it was blustery enough when I walked across campus earlier. Right. So it was enough. Blustery day. Yes. That's right. the Winnie the Pooh story. A oh. blustery. Nobody cares. Oh, <laughs> oh, Eeyore. We do care. <laughs> right. ASM has a special opportunity for our podcast listeners. Get fifty dollars off registration for Microbe twenty eighteen, June seventh to eleventh in Atlanta, using the promo code ASM Pod. ASM Microbe twenty eighteen connects scientists with their science and showcases the best microbial sciences in the world. Delve into your scientific niche in eight different tracks. Don't miss this opportunity. Visit asm.org slash microbe. That's asm.org slash microbe. And use the promo code ASMPOD for $50 off registration. See you in Atlanta. I'm going to use that code. You know, 50 bucks is 50 bucks. Hey, yeah. Right? It adds up. Yeah, after. I'll use it. Good. Go for it. And that way they will know that we have reach. <laughs> 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 Any news from ASV? Uh, the only thing is the same thing that I told people last week, that the housing registration for on-campus housing is open. I hope in two weeks when I'm back on TWIV to have some exciting news about a new thing that we're adding to the meeting. Uh, but... So just stay tuned for that. Stay tuned. As they say, stay tuned. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. We, my lab took a field trip this week. Big, it was a big crowd. <laughs> Two people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but we went to see the beautiful brain, the exhibit of the drawings of Santiago Ramon y Cajal. Oh, we talked about this over a year ago that it was coming to NYU. So for those of you who don't know, he was a neuroscientist who looked at slices of various brains, a lot of human brains and other kinds of brains in the microscope and spinal cords too and peripheral ganglia and drew pictures in pen and pencil. And all these, many of these still exist. They're most, they're, I believe, permanent exhibit in Madrid, but here's a traveling exhibition of a selection and they're amazing to just stand right in front of them and see these drawings. Oh my gosh. Did he use a camera lucidum? What the hell is that? <laughs> That's a, it, it is a, a light box. Yeah. It uh, takes the image in the microscope and sort of splits the image. One part goes to your eye. Yeah. And the other part goes down 
to the other part of the table that you're sitting at. And if there's a piece of paper down there, you can then draw what you're looking at under the microscope. No, and it's sort of tracing rather than drawing from memory. I don't know. Okay. I, all I know is that they're beautiful. It's really cool to see them up close. Yeah. And I would point out that these are the cells we've been destroying for the last 35 years in my laboratory, <laughs> in mice and other and in culture now. Oh, you mean destroying it as part of experiments, yes. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, the poster, which <laughs> I... Not at the bar. The poster is oh. beautiful. Uh, it has uh, astrocytes, his drawing of astrocytes. Hmm. It's lots of astrocytes, neurons. And it turns out... Yeah, you know, when you make slices and you look, these cells are pretty compact together, so he moved them apart a little bit. He used artistic license to separate them and right. et cetera. But they're awesome. It's unfortunately it's only till the end of March here in New York City. And how large are these drawings? I mean, give us some perspective here. How large are they? Oh, mm -hmm. mostly smaller than a than a sheet of paper. Oh. Okay. A lot of them are on small pieces. Okay. None of them are yeah. huge at all. Okay. Yeah. So I put the link to the show in and then if you uh, click down in it, you can see some images. So one is listed as five and seven eighths by seven and an eighth inches. Mm -hmm. Got it. But they're all in this, the paper is is yellowed. You know, cause well, it's all, sure. Also part of the exhibit, they had some modern confocal images of similar uh, fields to some of his images. So they have his image and then they have a full color. Yeah, know. that's very interesting. It's really right. cool. Mm -hmm. so, so they have some rainbow images. Yeah. They're pretty, yeah. Oh. Is so, it, where's this going next? I don't know. Is it going anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Let me check. No, it doesn't say anything. Huh. But it, it's probably traveling. So you should... Try and catch it. Catch it. Yeah, it's really amazing. I mean, I've never seen this before. How many drawings altogether were there? Uh, I would say um, at least 100. Oh, my. Yeah, and there were quite a few people there. It went in the middle of the day, and there were... Lovely. A lot of people who look like scientists. <laughs> what does that mean, right? right? They came with their lab coats but on. But <laughs> they, um, you know, it's right in an NYU building. It's right on Washington Square. Uh -huh. And it's uh, very easy to get to. It's a good venue. I'm sure it'll be somewhere else. And if I were in Madrid, I would go see it again because it's just amazing. Uh -huh. Okay. Who, uh, Linda Coughlin. Yes, Linda Coughlin is now an assistant professor at Mount Sinai. All right, congratulations. Congratulations, I guess Linda. Guess you're we'll, not going back to Ireland. We'll claim the twiv bump. <laughs> I bet. I bet. Now that she's here permanently, she'll have to come here more often. Every time I would contact her, she would. I would say, come back on twiv. She would say, oh, Palazzi is working me too hard. Well, now you only have yourself to blame. Right, that's I'm right. I'm working myself too hard. Exactly. I can't make it. Exactly right. Brienne, did you look into bird stings? I did look into bird sting. Um, in the end, I was able to actually find sting from 21 different birds. Wow. Um, wow. And 17 of them have the S that we were talking about in bats uh, that was in uh, sting from non-bats. Right. So bats hmm. were interesting because they had lost the searing. Right. Um, 17 of the birds I looked at had it. Um, the rest all had a deletion in that area. <laughs> interesting. Hmm. Wow. So something else must be used to interact with the kinases. Yes, exactly. That's cool. Thank you. Yes. We have a few follow-ups. First from Anthony. Anthony is, by the way, a listener in Jersey City. And we mentioned last time that um, I mentioned the mafia in Hoboken in response to some name, which I, scientific name, <coughs> which I forgot. And so he sent a link to an article, which he wrote. <laughs> In 2009, mm -hmm. in a on a website called Hudson County Facts, <laughs> and the title is "Soon Afterwards, Martin Casella Was Arrested for Plotting to Kill John Gotti." During the 70s and 80s, the corner of First and Jackson in Hoboken was the Hudson County headquarters of the mafia. <laughs> and it's this great article. It's, he and his uncle Gus would stop to drop off pigeon feed and pick up pigeons. <laughs> Yeah. I wonder if Pigeons these transactions books. actually serve to camouflage the real reason for the minutes. Yeah. It's, it's just great. It's just great. Yeah. So read it. Mm. It's very short. And so I'm trying to remember now what it was that I, okay, I can't remember, but I mentioned Mafia and Anthony uh, listens and picks things up. And he also sent a couple of articles about vertical transmission of bat, of viruses among bats. Right. Yeah. And also, um, so two, two articles, 
And then uh, the effect of rabies on bats. Right. He sends a link to a paper. He says, the study seems to show that bats do die from rabies. The common advice to avoid bats acting strangely is good to follow. The recent fatality in Florida was a child bitten by a visibly sick bat that the father was trying to rescue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they do say if the bats are acting weird or the raccoons. Yeah. <laughs> stay away how, from them. How about just don't play with bats? Exactly right. Even if they're I acting th- normal. I think that would be a Seems great like idea. A good idea. Yep. Yeah. Would be a great idea. Although they are cute. <laughs> You have a weird definition of cute. <laughs> I don't me, think you're cute. No, well, thank you. <laughs> so it's not weird, right? If I said I thought you were cute, you would say no, that's I've, weird. I've never been accused of being cute. Okay. Alan, can you read the next one? <laughs> okay. Islam writes, Dear Vincent, while responding to a listener's email on 1244, which was asking about influenza in SEALs, you asked whether there were, are any active surveillance programs. My ex-research group, headed by Professor Jonathan Runstadler and currently located at Tufts Veterinary School, is actually doing that. I was extremely lucky to have been associated with this excellent lab for a few years, during which I learned a lot about field work of wild influenza. Since 2013, Professor Runstadler and his group have been going out every January to the south shore of New England to sample seals. They consistently find serological evidence of influenza infection. However, isolation and subtyping of these viruses has been challenging. In a recent paper published in Emerging Microbes and Infections, they proposed that the North Atlantic gray seals could serve as wild influenza reservoirs Hmm. and gives a link. And here's an aerial picture of the team while sampling seals in the islands of Muskeget and Monomoy. Um, Sends along a photo. And then uh, these influenza disease ecology research efforts are funded through NIAID's Centers of Excellence of Influenza Research and Surveillance, aided by NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center and other collaborators. The capture and sampling techniques are quite clever. And he sends a press release from NOAA showing how they, how they catch the seals. Um, I'm also attaching a few pictures that demonstrate the extreme care with which these cute animals are captured, sampled, and released peacefully. I think you might like to hear more about these amazing field adventures and all the tough logistics that go behind them from current members of the Runstadler Lab, in particular my friends Dr. Wendy Perrier and Dr. Nicola Hill. Therefore, I'm proposing a twiv about wild influenza from Tufts Vet School during your next <laughs> visit to Massachusetts, and I'm willing to coordinate the whole thing. Awesome. Hmm. More about this interesting research can be found in this nice profile by Tufts Magazine, sends a link, and a recent blog post by Professor Runstadler in The Conversation, and another link. If the listener is interested in learning more about influenza and marine mammals, I suggest these two excellent reviews, um, and provides two links for those. And by the way, what is the plan for TWIV 500? Uh-huh. So he sent a number of photos, which I suggest you look at listeners because they're pretty neat and uh, where would I find them listeners think well in every episode there's a link to letters that we read there you go <laughs> and you have to go to microbe.tv <coughs> slash twiv to the relevant episode you will see at the bottom of the show notes letters read in this episode you click it you go to a page and you'll see all the letters and often listeners have links that are interesting and here we will put these photos and I, <laughs> I think it's so funny they sit on the seal while they take blood <laughs> I guess yeah. you have to because they're yeah. big animals, right? They are. Yeah. And, you know, they, they have sharp teeth. No sure. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> There's one picture now. I'm not able to find it again, but it's a head-on view of the two people sitting on the seal and then the seal's eyes and all of the eyes are looking right at the camera. <laughs> so you just wonder, what's the seal thinking? <laughs> Can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> yeah, they right. they. Pick them up in these uh, mats. Two people carry them up yep. the beach, and then they, when per, they sit on them, and then they draw blood, and then they, I guess they, and they them, weigh right? them. They weigh them too. Yeah, right. Seals are pretty cool. I saw a picture recently of a seal eating an octopus, though, and that's that's in my view, that's just terrible. Because octopus are very smart, and I think <laughs> you shouldn't eat them. Oh, tell that to the Greeks. <laughs> I have eaten octopus in the past, but oh, right. I don't. Mm. I love it, but I'm not going to eat it anymore because they're really? intelligent, oh. very intelligent animals, and we shouldn't be eating them. Mm. Well, that's just how my you, personal. How do you feel about squid? Uh, you know, they they don't do the same thing for me as octopus. Okay. <laughs> Cuddlefish. Calamari is still okay. Right. You know the problem, Alan. At my, my point in my life, I don't really want to eat anything living, including plants. So I'm going to either oh. die or change my view. Yeah, <laughs> it's a problem. I don't think you're going to convince the seals to stop eating octopi anytime. No, no, no. 
The only right. alternative you have, uh, Vincent, is to become uh, symbiotic with algae that live inside your skin cells. Yeah. Then you can become photosynthetic. Photosynthesize. That become such a sap. <laughs> uh, Kathy, can you take the next one? Uh, that's from Jake. Yeah. Hi, Twib team. I just had a quick comment relating to Kathy's episode 484 pick about the different formats of phylogenetic trees. So this might stray dangerously close to Twivo territory. <laughs> I hope your listeners don't mind. I admit I share her general distaste for irregular ways of presenting trees intended to be, to actually be interpreted for meaning rather than for purely artistic purposes. However, I listened to the episode in the afternoon, and that morning I read a brand new perspective paper that reminded me of the occasional utility of these layouts, specifically the radial format. The paper is, Major New Microbial Groups Expand Diversity and Alter Our Understanding of the Tree of Life by Castell and Banfield, published in Cell on March 8th, and he gives a link. Their figure 1A, copied below, is a beautiful radial tree that, in my opinion, perfectly illustrates the two-domain hypothesis of life. In contrast to the traditional three-domain tree of life, where eukaryotes, bacteria, and archaea are considered the major domains, more recent discoveries of groups of archaea led to a phylogenetic tree, or lead to a phylogenetic tree, where eukaryotes are firmly couched within the archaea. In other words, archaea are now considered paraphyletic rather than monophyletic. I don't think a more traditional phylogenetic tree would illustrate this nearly as well, especially things like the distance between the archaea and eukaryote domain and the bacteria domain. So in this instance, so I didn't read that well enough, the, especially things like the distance between the archaea plus eukaryote domain and the bacteria domain. So in this instance, I personally think the radial tree was a great choice. To be honest, I just really like this tree, so I wanted you all to see it too. Keep up the good work <laughs> on the Twix podcast. All the best, Jake. P.S. The weather here in Uppsala, Sweden, is a pleasant two, minus two Celsius with blue and sunny skies. It looks like we're finally coming to the end of the long winter, although the snow isn't going anywhere just yet. And so he did paste in this image from the cell paper. And I think just for the color scheme of the branches, it's really pretty. It uh, is. Yeah. It's it is. really lovely. And it is a radial tree, and it, it, it looks like it's... You know, standing on the, the roots, and then there's the branches up top with a very skinny trunk, so you could consider it still a tree. Um, so, I, Yeah, I think this is a little different from the radial designs that you were complaining about. Yeah. I yeah. think of the radial plot as being really circular. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then everything coming out from that. This is, this is more, I don't know, semi-linear. Yeah, well, the, um, the the link that I pasted in also did not like this format and did call this the radial form. And then the, I forget what exactly what they called the circular form. They had another name plus circular. Um, but, yeah. Ixon, you having trouble there? Nope. You're frowning. No, I'm looking up my email while you guys are busy talking. N nice. Oh. <laughs> really nice. All right, then we're going to start with a snippet. With, this one was suggested by Daniel who wrote, Dear Twiv Team, in this recent paper about functional insulin-like peptides produced by some iridoviridae might pique your interest. I wonder what the exact function of these peptides are in the viral life cycle. Mm -hmm. Daniel is a PhD student at ETH Zurich. All right, Daniel, we are not going to answer your question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we will talk about it because it's very interesting. By the way, listeners, if you'd like us to talk about something, you could send it in. We sometimes uh, have coincident interests. <laughs> All right, this is a paper. What's that, Daniel? <laughs> Dixon? <laughs> I said it could happen. It's a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Viral insulin-like peptides activate human insulin and IGF-1 receptor signaling, a paradigm shift for host microbe interactions. No, I don't think it's a paradigm shift. It's a bit much, but you can decide. Um, that's my personal um, opinion. Um, so this comes from Harvard Medical School, Kumamoto University, uh, Indiana University, which we recently visited, and uh, Deduve. Uh, where is that? It's in Brussels. Uh, Brussels. Luzon, yeah. The Duve Institute, okay. And, uh, and Novo and Nova Nordisk. Nordisk. Right. 
First, uh, first two, three authors. I don't know how many to look to tell you here, but the first author is Emra Altindis and Y. Kong Kai, and the last author is C. Ronald Kahn. And the, the thing here is that virus genomes are known to encode uh, growth factor-like molecules. So they said, what about peptide hormone-like molecules? Okay, let's look for them. So they mined, they did a bioinformatics search looking for homologies encoded in viral genomes to 62 human peptide hormones, metabolism-related cytokines or growth factor precursors. And they found viral sequences that had pretty good um, alignment, uh, 16 different peptide hormones, and that includes insulin, insulin-like growth factor 1 and 2, tumor necrosis factor, endothelin 1 and 2, transforming growth factor beta 1 and 2, fibroblast growth factor 19 and 21, interleukin 6, inhibin, adiponectin, resistin, adipsin, and irisin. Oh, man, those last few. Yeah. <laughs> I love resistin. Resistin, that's right. <laughs> adipsin and irisin. I, frankly, I haven't heard of adipsin and irisin. Resistant is futile. Resistant is inevitable. <laughs> it is inevitable. Most of these were found in double-stranded DNA viruses, like pox viruses, herpes viruses, and iridoviridae, which also encode growth factor and other host-like sequences. And, and roll nicely off the tongue. Iridoviridae. Iridoviridae. And iridoviridae are big viruses. Polyhedral virions, 120 to 350 nanometers in diameter. Hmm. And uh, they typically infest, amph infect amphibia, fish, and invertebrates. Now, these are not quite as big as the giant viruses, right? No. Just big. Uh, these are, yeah, more like some big pox viruses. Poxies, or pox guys, yeah. All right, so what do they find and what do they do? Uh, four viral insulin slash IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1 peptides, or VILPs, <laughs> VILPs for short, high sequence alignment, conservation of all the cysteine residues that are needed for folding. And they found these in, here are the viruses, lymphocystis disease virus 1 and lymphocystis disease virus SA, grouper iridovirus, at which point I get hungry, grouper, yep. although I shouldn't eat groupers, right? Singapore grouper <laughs> iridovirus, fishes, <laughs> right? Yeah. They're all fishes. So lymphocystis is a, is a disease, the it's a fish virus. Yeah. It's a fish virus, yes. And they're, they're going well. fishing here. Isn't that perfect? Yes. <laughs> yes, they went fishing for these proteins in fish. And they could fold the VILPs onto the known structure of these peptides as well. Mm -hmm. So basically, they look like the real thing. But now, all these viruses are from fish, right? What, Dixon? Didn't they fish, though, with the, <laughs> the human genome equivalents for the growth hormones and stuff? They did. Yeah, yeah. 60, they found sixty-two human peptides. Yeah, so they're, they're looking for sequences that are similar to the human peptides. Exactly, exactly. And they, they found, found them. They found them in fish virus. Found them in oh, fish. Yeah, that's the right. bottom so, line here. What, so what the hell? Say, I, I think what you're <laughs> what getting the, at though. What is the? <laughs> it, it shouldn't be that surprising that these look like and can be folded to look like sure. human insulin because that was kind of the initial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. The screen. But these are encoded in viral genomes, so that they're yes. there and they're so close is kind of weird. And especially since they're not human viruses, as far yes. as we know, mm -hmm. they're fish viruses. Right. So when you eat fish, if they're infected, maybe you get a you know a jolt of so zilfs. How close <laughs> are the fish hormones to ours that do the pretty, same thing? Apparently, they're pretty close. They must be, otherwise yeah. they wouldn't have come up, right? Well, they say that the fish uh, hormones are very similar. They didn't test fish cells for responses. Well, these no. are... Very much like yeah, I uh, thought that was a curious. Well, maybe they just aren't good fish cells. Cell lines. Yeah, fish. Well, we can get into it. But I was actually thinking it would be really nice if they could have infected some lab fish, and it right. depends how broad host range the viruses are. Yeah, but exactly. you know, like sticklebacks or zebrafish or something that right. you can grow in Tilapia. the lab would have been nice. And then see if these peptides are produced and if they have some effect, right? Right. right. Mostly to see if they have exactly. some effect. Yeah. Mm. And I know nothing about insulin metabolism in fish, so I don't know what it does. Yeah, and I know nothing about it in any other organism as well. <laughs> I, I do know that tuna, for instance, though, are, yeah. are considered warm-blooded. Really? Yeah, they have a very high metabolic rate. Mm. So they must use insulin to generate lots of energy, I think. They mobilize their glycogen mm -hmm. stores very nicely. Okay. 
So what what do you think the virus insulin would be doing? Well, first of all, it's not a growth growth hormone. How about that? So one? here's the thing: are these clearly fish uh, insulin like vilfs, right? Or yeah. are they all so close that it doesn't matter? So I guess fish have receptors. So right. I mean, in the end, you know, these are mitogens. They make cells divide and they increase glucose metabolism, right? Exactly. So when viruses want to need to do that, right? They need to get cells uh, in a good metabolic state and they want them to divide. So maybe that's part of the function. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It may also, you know, change the replication machinery to help replicate the virus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to back up and, re- and remind everybody that they also found sequences in pox viruses and herpes viruses, and they don't yeah. go into which pox viruses or herpes viruses. Yeah. And I think what we're bemoaning here is that we, we're not sure of the relationship between the fish, fish. peptides and the human peptides, but these right. fish yeah, virus right. uh, sequences yeah. have some similarity. Right. Yeah, all those experiments were done in mammalian cells in this paper. By the way, IGF-1 is a mediator of growth hormone effects, hmm. right? So growth hormone um, binds um, receptors, and then the liver makes IGF-1, which then stimulates growth and so forth as growth-promoting activities. So now I so did a couple of experiments to show that these VILPs can bind Human insulin and IGF-1 receptors, they do some binding assays with iodinated insulin and IGF-1. Remember that, Dixon? Iodination. Who could Kathy would that? remember, too. Yeah. That's no fun. Path, piles and piles of lead bricks. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> remember when I was a student, there was a guy, who Jim Wetmer, had lots of iodine in his hood, and his hood, it backed up onto an office of another p- uh, <laughs> of course, he had bricks in front of the hood, but not behind. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Until whoops. that that guy walked in one day and looked at it and said, "Duh." <laughs> and back then, people walked around smoking pipes. Do you remember those days? He walked in with his pipe and said, "What is this? <laughs> what are these bricks for?" And he says, "Well, I use a lot of iodine here." And he said, "Well, I'm right behind it." <laughs> yep. So they do binding assays. They show that these VILPs bind receptors on on human cells. They also can. So when these VILPs bind. They normally induce signal transduction pathways involving phosphorylation, and they look at that as well. And these can induce downstream signaling pathways as well. And again, these are from fish. They've synthesized the peptides. They add them to mammalian cells. I think they use mouse and, and some human cells here. Yeah, they do. And they have activity. Yeah. They stimulate proliferation. Oh, this is a great one. Thymidine incorporation. We're going back to the old experiment <laughs> to measure DNA <laughs> DNA synthesis. <laughs> right. I've, I've done three experiments in my life that include radioactivity, and we just hit two of the three. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and who could forget that Rosalind Yellow won the Nobel Prize for inventing the radio immunoassay? Yeah, that's right. Essay. That's right. She did, and she was right here in the she Bronx. Was right in the Bronx. The Bronx. The Bronx. And so they these peptides on human fibroblasts stimulate uh, proliferation, as measured by DNA incorporation of thymidine, a precursor into DNA. They also uh, it stimulate glucose uptake right. on cells. Uh, they look at adipocytes. I like to say adipocytes because some people say adipocytes. I don't think that's right. Adipocytes. Whatever. So they have <laughs> biological activities. They do. Now, the last part of this paper, they look... <laughs> They look for evidence that humans might be infected with these viruses. Right. And if you look at fecal viromes and blood viromes of humans, you can find these sequences. Because it doesn't mean they're replicating. You can exactly. You can find the sequences. That's an, a very yeah. important point. You see mm-hmm. sequences and of it, the viruses. Of the of viruses. The viruses. Not, not of this stuff, but should be there if it's uh, Right. So what viruses do they find? They find iridoviridae, um, LCDV1 and SGIV. Those are two of the viruses so the, here. One of the grouper ones yeah. and the other fish one. So I think these individuals just ate some fish and the you know the viruses yes. have coursed mm-hmm. through them, probably. But they say taken together with data, these data support the hypothesis that humans are exposed to or can carry these iridoviruses and that VILPs produced by these viruses could be involved in either triggering or protection from disease. No, 
because we don't know if they're actually replicated. That's a real stretch. It's yes. a stretch. That's why I think the paradigm shift in the title is a stretch. Mm. Right. Yes. You have to eat a lot of fish before it changed what was happening with disease. And eating that much fish is going to change what's happening with your metabolism anyway. Exactly. <laughs> so one thing that I thought was interesting in the discussion, they note that in fish that harbor these viruses, the most common phenotype is tumor-like growths on the skin. So that could be because they're making these mitogens, right, and you're stimulating right. cell division. So mm -hmm. it would be interesting to take these genes out of the virus and infect fish and see if you still get tumors, right? So they may have some relevance to, to these viruses infecting fish, but I'm not sure that we know if they have any relevance for human infections. Right. I'd be more interested to see what went on with the pox viruses and herpes viruses. Maybe that's another paper, right? Right. Right. What's this? When was this published? How long ago? Uh, um, December 2017. Oh, that's when it was sent, sent for review. Contributed yeah. January 29th, yeah, it's 2018. Recent. It's recent. So there could be other. They say here, the hormones here may be the tip of the iceberg because, you know, we've only got 2% of all the viruses out there. There could right. be many more. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, it's interest I think the most interesting thing is that these peptides can affect mammalian cells, but again, they're all conserved. They're very highly conserved, so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not so. And they were only able to find these VILPs in four out of 21 iridoviridae yeah. sequences. Yeah, that's puzzling, isn't it? Yeah. Not all of them. Well, Dixon, I thought you would like it because it's fish, but they're saltwater fish, right? right? Okay. I like saltwater Groupers are saltwater? Yeah, groupers are saltwater. What about the other one? What is uh, this lymphocystis disease virus? Do you know what kind of fish that goes into? Does, uh, does it, it only said fish where I looked it up. <laughs> right. I'm just, just <laughs> anyway, Googling that up. I thought you would like to have a fish. I do. Uh, right. Lymphocystis right. is a common viral disease in freshwater and saltwater fish, apparently. Uh -huh. And then there are some fish that are both of those things. Yes. Anadromous fish? Indeed. Or catandromous. What's the difference between anadromous and catandromous? Anadromous fish spawn in freshwater and live in saltwater. And the other way, the catandromous other are the ones that live in freshwater and spawn in saltwater. And those are the eels. Wow. I love those words. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> I like um, autochthonous also. You do? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I also like, you know, probably 10 years ago, you told me what decimate means. Yeah. And, I didn't, yes. and most people probably don't use it properly. <laughs> they don't. 10 years ago? <laughs> Even in, Rome, yes. ago. Yeah, yeah, in right. Roman times, they were sure to use it just the way they meant it. <laughs> but, and language evolves. That's fine. Yeah, that's it right. Does. All right. We have a main article now from ho Cell Host and Microbe called... Dicer 2 dependent generation of viral DNA from defective genomes of RNA viruses modulates antiviral immunity in insects. And this touches a bunch of ARCs yes. that we've had recently. Not and I think this is open access, by the way. Yeah. I think so too. I don't think I had to log in to get it. The um this is a funny author collection here. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because you have one first author and then like Three middle authors who contributed. <laughs> no, two, two. the second author is a sole second author. We have yeah. co third authors. Co third authors, third authors, right. Yeah, co third authors, exactly. <laughs> so I said. Um, so the first author is Enzo Poirier, and then the uh, last author who is identified as the lead contact is Maria Sally, who was on a TWIV in Montreal, uh, TWIV 301. She talked about these defenses, which are coming up in this paper. And also on this paper is Marco Vignuzzi, and they're both from the Pasteur in, in Paris. And we had Marco on Tuivo some time ago. You should check that out. It was a really good episode. And so this is from the Institut Pasteur, the University of Paris Diderot, Iowa State University, Université Montpellier, and Université de Perpignan. Boy, how did Iowa get in there, huh? <laughs> Maybe they took some trips. That would be good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. So this is all about RNA-based antiviral defenses in insects. And we've talked about this a lot. We had Ben Tenuver talk about RNA's three domains, which is going to play a role in this. And RNAi, RNA interference, 
is a main antiviral Im- immune defense system in insects, right? In mammals, it's controversial, but in insects, it's pretty clear. And um, so what happens is viruses infect a insect cell, an enzyme called Dicer2, detects this RNA, chops it up, makes 21 nucleotide long, small interfering RNAs. You're being silly. No, I'm not. I'm just uh, trying to... Um... And then those are loaded into a RNA-induced silencing complex, also known as RISC. And part of RISC is an enzyme called Argonaut 2 ago. It's an endonuclease that will then be guided to any new viral RNAs that are made and chop it up. Sounds like a CRISPR thing. Yeah, the, the main difference is that, you know, CRISPRs are encoded in the, they're stored in the genome, right? Right. And these are not. Right. So that's the uh, RNA-based defense. And now a twist on this, which Carla talked about a little bit in her uh, Montreal twiv, is that this siRNA defense is amplified by reverse transcription. <sighs> which is crazy. <laughs> it's amazing. I, when I heard her say that, I'm like, what? <laughs> Why? <Yeah. laughs> Why, what, where, how? Well, that's what this paper tries to begin to address. So you basically, you take some of this incoming viral RNA, you make a DNA copy, and you you use that to make even more <laughs> RNA to amplify the siRNA right. response. Mm-hmm. Isn't that cool? And of course, all cells have reverse transcriptase in the form of retrotransposons, you know, jumping genes. They have RT encoded in them. And so um, that- and In general, DNA tends to be the, the more archival- format in biology. So you, you make RNA when you need a temporary copy. You make DNA when you want to keep it around for a while. Yeah. Although it wasn't always like that, apparently, in the world. Right. right. Yes. Now DNA is archival. Those of you who buy hard drives, just remember that DNA Put is Put it on archival. DNA. All right. So um, in this paper, they're trying to figure out um, a little bit about this DNA intermediate, you know, where how it's made and, and so forth. And, and they use... Um, uh, Drosophila uh, and some Drosophila viruses. They also use uh, mosquitoes and some some mosquito viruses. Okay, so yes, they're all they're all RNA viruses. Are they all plus strand RNA viruses? Yeah, they are. Okay. Drosophila C virus, Sinbis, Chikungunya plus Dixon. How many different genome types are there? Uh. It's got seven up. Okay, <laughs> I have to keep reminding you. Right, the first thing is. Um, what what kind what is this DNA all about? So they 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 infect fruit flies um, with either flockhouse virus, which is an insect virus, or Drosophila C virus or Synbis, and then they extract DNA. And I love this. They have a DNA it's called DNA plasmid safe. This is a trade name, clearly, because it's all capitalized. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. This is an ATP dependent DNA that removes only linear DNA. It doesn't cut circles. Hmm. And basically, they can show that. Uh, even after treating with this, there's some DNA left, which uh, clearly is circular. So there's both linear and circular DNA made in, in response to RNA virus infection. If you do this from a mock-infected fly, you don't get any DNA. And they're using PCR to, to amplify these. They also did this in mosquitoes with chick, chikungunya, same thing, linear and circular DNA. So that's pretty cool, right? Generated from the input sure. virus RNAs. And the circular DNA can last up to two weeks. After infection, it persists. So as, as Alan said, as long as two weeks is archival, it's archival. Sure. <laughs> a rel- relative to RNA messages and probably the viral infection, that's that's long term. Yeah. And uh, relative to the lifespan of... How long does a fly live? Case. Yeah. Well, mosquitoes are two weeks, three right? weeks. Yeah. yeah. All right. So he, this next experiment is very cool. They extract circular viral DNA from these infected cells, right? Just DNA, no RNA. They inject it into fresh flies. Then they infect them. Mm, Fresh flies. Fresh. Fresh flies? (laughs) You know, they speak poorly. They speak, they they curse a lot. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) They have an increase in survival time when they inject them with the circular viral DNA. So they're kind of immunizing them, right? Yeah, so I think that before I was being picky um, about adaptive immunity. Yeah, yeah, and, right. And you know, this is this is a typical adaptive immunity kind of experiment. So you would call this adaptive? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> no. It's not tailored to the pathogen, right? Uh, it is tailored to the pathogen. Well, it is the path. It's derived from right. it, yeah. I guess. Yeah. They, they have, especially in G, some experiments where they use uh, non-matching uh, viral DNA. Yeah, that's right. If you use the wrong DNA, it doesn't protect. It's not protected. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you, could, adapted, you but can, it is certainly protection. You can certainly, I mean, you have to change your definitions as time right. goes. Right, and in this right. experiment that they're doing, they're kind of doing a, um, oh, it just went out of my head. Um, Did it fly immunity. out? Did it fly out? <laughs> yes, it flew out. <laughs> it's sort of a passive immunity. So they're giving the yeah, protective. That's right. Uh, anyway. Yeah, that's true. Right. And then you're right, it's sequence specific. You give them one, flock house DNA doesn't protect against. Uh, Drosophila C virus. And then they found that this DNA induces sRNAs. They extract small RNAs from the cells that are injected with this circular viral DNA, and they see 21 nucleotide RNAs. Um, and these RNAs map across the viral genome. All right. Now, uh, what is cool is that next they go, what do these DNAs look like? Let's do some sequencing and see what they're made up of, right? Because we haven't done that yet before. And they find that these circular viral DNAs are composed of viral sequences and <laughs> sequences from Drosophila retrotransposons. Retrotransposon is a piece of DNA that can move around, right? Typically composed of long terminal repeats, and uh, they, f they, they uh, surround a coding region for reverse transcriptase. So these circular viral DNAs are not just viral. They are viral plus parts of retrotransposons. Hybrids. They're hybrids. Right. And these retrotransposons have wonderful names like diver. <laughs> That's a great one. Micropia or micropia, <laughs> you know. And what it's is from interesting- from the moth? Is that from the moth? I don't know. Cecropia. Well, micropia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. is probably, yeah. These um, parts of the viral genome are not the whole genome. They're missing bits. They're two non-contiguous regions. They look at flock house in particular. So again, in these circular viral DNAs, it's not the whole viral genome that's representative. It's just pieces of it, and they're non-continuous pieces, non-contiguous or non-contiguous, right? And so um, it looks like they're coming. Here's another arc. They're coming from defective viral genomes. Right. Mm -hmm. Remember that for the flu paper we did a couple of weeks ago? This is amazing because... The walking dead. They, defective genomes are coming back. We're starting to realize mm -hmm. the walking real dead. importance. Last time we talked about their importance in flu, making flu more or less virulent, and now, look, it's, a, it's playing a role in antiviral RNA-based immunity in flies, defective mm -hmm. viral genomes. Mm -hmm. And this, this bit with, you've got a little... You've got pieces of the fly genome. You've got pieces of the viral genome. I mean, it's so close to just copying the viral pieces into the fly genome in a CRISPR-type strategy. Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah. In fact, they say that these DNAs may be precursors of the EVEs. Remember right. EVEs? That's another arc that we did viral, yeah. in mosquitoes, which uh, we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And, and that makes perfect sense. Yeah, then they could integrate, right? So, Very easy to So do. the juxtaposition of the viral and fly sequences is interesting. They don't really know how these are made or where. Yeah, that's certainly the one that I have lots of questions about. Um, there's got to be some way to try to target this to viral transcripts. You wouldn't want to take cellular transcripts, copy right. them, and silence them. That would be pretty <laughs> bad for the cell. Right. Um, so how is this uh, targeted is sort of the question I've had lots of, I wanted to know more about. Yeah, that's obviously stuff that needs to be done. And how, how is it made? How is it preferentially targeting the defective genomes? Yeah, another good yep. question. All right. So speaking of defective genomes, they they they're using now Synbis virus. Synbis is an alpha virus, which uh, plus strand RNA virus mosquito transmitted, and they can grow this so that a lot of defective genomes are made. So they have wild type Synbis in Synbis with lots of defective genomes kind of reminiscent of the flu paper, right? right. And um, then they, they infect, this one is uh, flies. And these, these defective genomes are only found in flies infected with 
defective virus. In other words, if you look at the DNA in these infected flies, you only see defective DNA when you have defective DNA in the virus. So what's happening is that's being copied to make the circular viral DNA. And the reason it's defective is because those defective genomes are preferentially being copied. They're templates for viral DNA synthesis. And remember, they're both linear and circular forms of this DNA. And both of them are made. So the bottom line is that the defective genomes are the templates for the synthesis. And that's what, what uh, Brianne said before. Why would that be? We really don't know. Good question. Yeah, right. I just think that's real so interesting. It is. All right. So um, if you, this, now this viral DNA from defective viral genomes, if you, um, they want to know if this can amplify the small interfering RNA response, which we showed before for by injecting DNA from into flockhouse virus into cells. They inoculate flies with wild type or the high defective producing synbis. And this one has a mutation in the viral polymerase that generates more defectives. It's really cool. Same thing we saw at flu, right? Uh, and then they infect Ago 2 mutant flies. Argonaut 2 cannot take the small interfering RNAs and chop up viral RNAs with it. All right, so they're defective in that, that enzyme. And they don't see a decrease in virus titer in the Ago 2 minus fly. So in other words, this putting this DNA in, which previously we showed can reduce viral titers, that effect is reduced if you don't have Argonaut there which shows that it's stimulating RNA-based or RNAi-based immunity. So DVGs are important for generating these circular DNAs, but you got to have Argonaut there to have an effect, which shows you that the circular DNAs are being used for the production of small interfering RNAs. They also do a cool experiment where they treat flies with AZT, <laughs> a reverse transcriptase inhibitor. <laughs> <laughs> and the first AIDS drug developed, and this drops down the the effect of uh, the defective viral genomes because the um, the DNA is being made by reverse transcriptase. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that is really cool. Good good experiment. Uh, so this is all done um, in flies. They do the same experiments in mosquitoes using chikungunya. They can make high defective genome chikungunya, and they can show that when you have a lot of high de of defective genomes, you have a lower infection in the, in the mosquitoes. So in diverse hosts, this DNA seems to be feeding into the RNA interference pathway against viruses. Right. Pretty cool. Now we move into a little bit more detail about what's doing this, and this is where it gets kind of even more interesting. Mm -hmm. So we know, and we talked about this in with our flu defective genome paper, these defective genomes really stimulate the innate immune system. They're sensed by, you know, the RNA sensors, the big eye-like receptors and so forth. Uh, and in fact, the big eye-like receptors in mammals and these uh, DICER2 are both members of a family of ATP aces that have similarities. They have similar RNAs3 domains. So they're thinking maybe uh, DICER has, plays a role in the synthesis of uh, DNA from these viral RNA genomes. Well, is it the synthesis or is it the sensing? Both. It's both. Okay. So they start out to look at synthesis. Because if you look here, they say, two, right. we hypothesize that the helicase may play a, a role in the synthesis. But it perhaps through RNA binding, sensing, or activation of, of other proteins. So they have a variety of Drosophilos that have mutations in um, DICER. DICER has a helicase domain. In fact, on the first page of this paper, there's a nice cartoon of DICER. Part of DICER is RNAs3. That's the chop-up domain, and then part of it is a helicase. And they have changes, amino acid changes, in these flies in and outside of the helicase domain. And that helicase domain, similar to the one found in rig eye-like helicases in the mammalian cells. 
And so some of these changes make higher DNA, viral DNA in the cell. Some of them make lower DNA. And the amount of DNA they see is is inversely proportional to the virus titers. So if you have high viral DNA made, you get low virus and vice versa. Inverse correlation between the levels of viral DNA and what they call viral load. Right. So that kind of implies that if you make more of these, um, you're maybe combating virus well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Plus, um, changes in this enzyme that impact viral DNA synthesis don't affect the production of small interfering RNAs. So there, this this protein can do both. It can it's involved in the production of DNA and the production of SI RNAs. So the siRNA part is from the RNA's three domain. That makes perfect sense. But the DNA synthesis part, because that's done by reverse transcriptase, the role of this enzyme, I don't know what it's doing. Maybe it's recruiting it or something, right? Because it's not doing it itself. Right, exactly. So that's really it. The no. viral, controlling viral infections depends on this dicer 2, which is involved in making DNA and making small interfering RNAs from incoming viral genomes. And so the key now is how, so DICER has a helicase domain and an RNAs3 domain. As I said, the RNAs3 domain is involved in producing of short interfering RNAs. Mutations outside of the helicase domain affect viral DNA production. So how that happens, I think that's the next really interesting question. You know, how that, because we know it's reverse transcriptase that's involved. So how is DICER? And they say, we don't know how DICER regulates the accumulation of DNA. Right. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting here, they say this work establishes a conserved role mm-hmm. of defective viral genomes as PAMPs, pathogen-associated yes. molecular patterns. I think this is brilliant because, you know, we've always thought that these defective genomes are kind of accidents. They're garbage and right. Right, we don't need it, but they're really good for triggering antiviral responses. Now, that's not good for the virus. Right. But we assume we we assume that these sequences are either doing something for the virus or they are unavoidable for the virus, that the virus simply can't um, keep its replication reliable enough to prevent the production of these defective genomes. Yeah, of course, it's not good for the virus to um, have an innate response. However, if you now here we see that with a good circular DNA response, the virus persists, right? Right. And they make this interesting statement. Virus titers do not reflect the fitness cost of virus infection right. in insects. But if you have a, in these experiments, often the flies lived longer, but there was no effect on virus titer. So the implication is that maybe the right level of antiviral response will allow prolonged infection, which is a good survival strategy for the virus, right? So that maybe that's right. where the making of defective genomes comes in and allows persistence. Right. Kill, killing the host is not really in the virus's interest. It's, it's not. Just, just, it's not, no. Well, I was just going to say that they talk about this a little bit in the intro, uh, in the introduction as well. And I hadn't, I guess I've never considered much about persistent viruses in um, Drosophila and mosquitoes. Um, and I remember really sort of perking up when I started to read about persistence yeah. versus death of the infected animals uh, at the beginning. Yeah, so one of the measures of antiviral effect is persistence. Not clearing, but persistence. It's very interesting. It's different from from a So are, are colonies of Drosophila ordinarily wiped out by viral infections, do you think? I, hmm. They can be. I've never heard of that, but I guess they're... I don't know. Good question. I was just... Now, here's another thing I, I wanted to point out. They say that, why is a de- defective genome a good why not the genome itself? Why do you need right. this defective genome? And they say, well, maybe because they're located in a different place in the cell. So uh, RNA viruses rep- typically replicate the genome on membranous structures, which may be shielded from innate responses. But these defective genomes are elsewhere, and they say maybe that's why it's a good PAMP. So that, that makes a lot of sense. I like that. Right, they, the, re, the rejects are just floating around, whereas the, <laughs> yeah. the good genomes yeah. are actually being packaged. You're, you go away. We don't want you here to right. play with us. Yeah, Homeless genomes. I, yeah. To be honest with you, I think that um, localization 
is yeah. uh, understudied in terms of thinking yes. about PAMPs. Um, I think that's a pr really important thing that people don't spend enough time thinking about. Yeah. Then they say uh, defective viral genomes may be under high selective pressure, which suggests that viruses may have developed strategies to regulate their production, which we were talking about before. More than a byproduct of viral replication, they se seem to be a key viral product that can modulate the host immune response. I think that's really great that we have come so f far from our original ideas about defective genomes. It's really, and yes. it's kind of emphasized nicely here. And then they say this circular DNA may be a precursor of integration, the EVEs, right, which we talked mm -hmm. about last time. Mm -hmm. And then finally they say maybe if we modulate this DNA, we can control infections. Maybe that's a target for modulation, which makes sense. So we have to figure out more about how that works. Funny if we end up treating uh, Zika virus infections with AZT, huh? In mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so there you go. I thought that was quite interesting. And we linked together a lot of different arcs. We had, um, so Carla Sally talked about RNA eye defenses in insect a long time ago, but very recently, TWIV 450, RNA 3, an ancient antiviral recognition platform that was Ben Tenuver. And That's such a uh, cool story. The RNA3 yeah. domain, of course, here in Dicer. And we and originally remember the story is that it evolved to process RNA and then it got taken up for defensive purposes. And then uh, TWIV 482, uh, Eves, Eves and Mosquitoes. Good, Dixon? Perfect. Good TWIV team. Everyone like that? Oh, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I like it. I learned a lot. That's mm -hmm. the... Um, key part learning a lot mm -hmm. it is we here on twiv we end up reading papers that we might not normally read this is all which true. includes the following paper which is from here's the letter from meg the letter from meg hello twiv posse <laughs> <laughs> readings from moco in the dc burbs montgomery county thank you there are all kinds of co's around there <clears throat> right in, yep. in washington give me another one i see it on the train pg pg county uh, eco or something okay it's just pg prince george's here we have soho right and noho right and it, dumbo right? do we have dumbo dumbo mm -hmm. down under the Manhattan bridge overpass yeah right. anyway greetings from moco in the dc burbs where it's too windy to matter what the temperature is outside my phone says 42 f 6 c stuff is flying around out there they closed nih today so i got a chance to catch up on my reading roofers are going to be needed around here tomorrow for what from what I saw while walking my dog and dodging debris. I don't know how many card-carrying neuroscientists you have among your listeners, but you have at least one. Like many scientists, I'm an artist at heart with a day job. You can see my brain art on Twitter at Brains Are Us. <laughs> good, good handle. I have an interest in virology and use viruses in my research. We use AAV, adeno-associated virus mostly, to carry fluorescent proteins or light-activated ion channels for optogenetics and new neurophysiology experiments. Mm -hmm. I am a neuroanatomist and neuropharmacologist, but I work closely with electrophysiologists and people who study behavior. I included my lab information below, which explains it all except how I came to study cannabinoids. I'm still trying to figure that out. So Margaret is a staff scientist in the section on synaptic pharmacology mm -hmm. um, at the NIH. Okay. So, so you just woke up one morning and realized you were studying cannabinoids. You don't remember how? <laughs> just trying to figure it out. Yeah. I think you all did a great job with the recent ARC neuro papers. I'm also fascinated by this work, so I'm glad you covered it. This brings me to the reason for this email that might involve a similar mechanism. It's at least an interesting paper. Alan suggested that I write, there's a problem with viral tract tracing that I keep encountering while others close their eyes or don't realize what they're seeing. This recent paper by Zing and colleagues confirmed my observation. AAV-mediated anterograde transsynaptic tagging mapping corticocollicular input-defined neural pathways for defense behaviors. Anterograde means towards the synapse. Open access, they use this to their advantage, which is great. The bigger picture could be a problem, though. The supporting data were more informative for me. An injection of the tracer AAV into certain region of cortex will infect cells in downstream areas in striatum, in my hands too. This could be retrograde transport 
from the axon terminals to the cell bodies, but I see it in pathways that are unidirectional, like cortex to spiny striatal projection neurons, so it must be anterograde, so scratch that idea. Mm. So it is anterograde. In fact, in that paper, the authors say it's anterograde. Second possibility is that there's transsynaptic transport of AAV, as the paper suggests. If this happens, how did the virus travel down a tiny submicron-sized axon full of microtubules and all of the things a neuron needs to do to actively transport the synapse and emerge as an infectious virus. Even rabies can't do that, right? Doesn't it need to replicate across a synapse? The AEVs are replication defective, so it must be the original input. Correct. It is. They are replication defective. Another idea is as old as tracked tracing itself. The cells died and released the tracer, but the virus in a capsid, it still has to get to the axon terminal. The next question is what is actually released from the virus-infected cell synapse. If it's intact virus, that means there was transport down axons full of microtubules and packed like cables for five millimeters or so. Brain fiber tracks aren't like blood vessels, so transport must have happened inside the cell. AAV is small, so maybe it hitchhiked a ride on the transport machinery and was released at possibly dying synapses, or maybe an arc virus-like particle. There has to be a lot of it, though, not sold on this idea. Could it be DNA or protein released? The recent ARC papers made me wonder if Cre is packaged and released, but this can't be the whole story. It would need to be something that's amplified, like Cre-mediated expression of a fluorescent protein in the postsynaptic cell in this paper in order to see it. Maybe it happens more than we realize, but the virus never makes enough fluorescent protein to be detected. PCR from a distal target would tell us. I disagree with their conclusion with the GFP virus because the worst offender in my hands is the general AAV CAMK promoter driving M. cherry, a fluorescent protein. It has to be intact virus or DNA in a lot of it, or we would never see the fluorescent protein from a CAMK promoter in the postsynaptic cell. It could be naked DNA and just a function of the amount of virus people use. Our viruses come titrated based on particles, not infectivity, but are usually in the neighborhood of 10 to the 13 particles per microliter. Wow. <laughs> we typically inject 100 nanoliters into brains. That's a lot of virus, national debt range into the <laughs> tiny mouse prefrontal <laughs> cortex. This brings me to another even crazier idea. This is actually my favorite hypothesis. <laughs> the AAV DNA was packaged into something else. Say the mouse has a virus that is similar enough to the AAV packaging requirements to package the replication defective AAV mm. genome into a different capsid, like herpes. I think you only need two factors, rep and cap and trans, to package, right? What are the odds of co-infection? We are getting mm. ready to use the AAV1 Cree strategy from this paper. It would be interesting to hear an opinion from, quote, actual virologists, end quote. <laughs> oh, I guess I should leave then. Yeah, not I'm me. right behind you. <laughs> How is this happening? Did I cover all the possibilities? This would be fun to try to figure out in the lab, but we're not equipped. AAV is supposed to stay put, and this is too big of an artifact to just ignore. You can't have infected local cell bodies when you're trying to stimulate axons, those cells have local collateral axons going to the neighbors too. See the problem? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's great for me, though, since I'm an anatomist, I get to see who's hooked up to who without resorting to rabies-based strategies. Mm -hmm. I hope the TWIV Brain Collective will consider my questions in this paper for a TWIV discussion. All right, so... In the interest of anterograde transport, I'm going to kick this question to Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I looked at this paper... So the idea here is you make it, you make an adeno-associated virus and you put a fluorescent protein in it and you, all you have in the virus are the ends of the DNA. So there's no way this is going to replicate. It's just going to put the DNA into cells and the mRNAs will be expressed and you'll get fluorescent proteins made. And what they're seeing is this is moving anterograde. All right? This is moving from the cell body where they inject it down to the synapse and that is not supposed to happen. In fact, in this paper, the paper is very good. They say this is a controversial issue, but they actually um, look at it here and, and decide in the end that this can be useful for, for mapping certain kinds of synapses. And Meg points out the issue, you know, you can't, you can't use this for every set of connections because for some it's going to mislead you. And in fact, they say that in the paper, you can only look at certain kinds of nerve connections with this tracer. But what they think is happening, so in, in their paper, the mice have integrated into their genome a Cree-dependent fluorescent reporter protein. And only when Cree is, de is delivered to those cells will, will it fluoresce. 
And so they say if they put an adeno-associated Cree into these mice, they can see fluorescence at the postsynaptic terminal after anterograde transport. But if they put fluorescent AAV alone, they don't see it. This is not enough. It's not sensitive enough. So they think very little virus is getting out of the nerve, crossing the synapse, and getting into uh, the postsynaptic cell. She doesn't agree with this, but I think it's the most likely explanation. I think it's the simplest. The other explanation she had, another virus, I don't think there's another virus in there. You know, these these are lab mice. Uh, arc particles, probably not. I say go for the simplest explanation first. And I think what you're doing is that you're injecting a lot of virus. Some of it is getting down there and crossing, and you don't need a lot to have this effect. Uh, so let's see. Vincent shaves with Occam's razor. The morning. exact yeah. mechanism by which it spreads is unclear, though it happens, but it appears to reflect a specific interaction between virus and host cells rather than a physical property such as passive diffusion. Um, and it, they notice that it only happens with certain serotypes also, which is kind of weird. And I don't know why that would be, but that would argue against some of the other mechanisms that she suggested. Well, anyway, those are my thoughts, but you know, this is not my... I don't have any brain cell like, uh, expertise, so I don't know. I just killed them. <laughs> so if there's anyone out there who's who works on tracing and is aware of this adeno-associated virus pro- problem, let us know. Yeah, and let Meg know. Well, exactly. He, yeah, the, the TWIV Brain Trust Collective, that's not just us. That's everybody out there. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Everybody out there. We're the Borg of Dixon, Brain Trust. Dixon, can you take the next one? Sure. Wink writes, Dear TWIV Professors, why are tenofovir and lamivudine effective in the control of two very different viruses, hepatitis B and HIV? Any? Yeah, guesses? because they both Besides have reverse- both have RT. <laughs> RT. They both have RT, and that's, that's right. it. And Vincent answers. <laughs> yeah, they both have RT. <laughs> that was very short. Reverse transcriptase. Yeah. And I say thank you, Wink, for a great exam question. Yeah, <laughs> that is very, very good. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Here's another one for you, um, Brianne. Why, so both viruses encode RT. Mm-hmm. Why does the hepatitis B particle have DNA in it and the HIV particle has RNA in it? Oh, so uh, yeah. Yes. Good exam question. Okay, Brienne, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Doug writes, Dear wise sages of TWIV, I am a software developer and white hat hacker with a specialty in medical informatics. I listen to Twix podcasts when I can and love Dr. Dr. Vincent Ricaniello's YouTube video course on virology. The parallels of virology and computer viruses are astonishing. I loved TWIM 125, a minimal cell operating system, as the Twimsters discussed <laughs> the J. Craig Venter Institute's efforts to create the minimal bacterial genome. One of the best ways to learn about computers is to hack on them and learn by trial and error. It seems like biohacking holds the same promises. I wonder how you feel about this recent YouTube video, developing a permanent treatment for lactose intolerance using gene therapy. Um, Mm -hmm. And he gives a link. As a software developer, this is exciting. But as someone who does not understand the risks in the field of virology, it's hard for me to know how to feel about this self-experimentation. I feel that biohacking on humans should be allowed, especially if the hacking is on rare and or terminal diseases. But it's hard to gauge based on the risks many point out in the comments section of the video. Would love to hear your learned debate. Thanks, Doug. P.S. I missed the chance to see TWIV 466, TWIM 164 live when Dr. Recaniello was at IU. Is there an upcoming schedule of upcom- or is there a schedule of upcoming visits to other universities? Um, and Doug is at Medical Informatics Engineering in Fort Wayne, Indiana. So, Doug, we we don't hack on people. We have clinical trials to regulate therapies that we want to test on people. Otherwise, it's not ethical to do that. Yeah, the term biohacking just means unregulated pharmaceutical development is what's going on here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this guy... Which, which is a really, really bad idea, and understand why all you have to do is look historically at what happened before we had these regulations. Um, and uh, if, if you Google elixir sulfanilamide, you'll find <laughs> out about the origins of the FDA and and why we can't just let this be a wild west. Right. Yeah, this video is a person who has supposedly made a adeno-associated virus to cure his lactose intolerance. And he- 
of all the things you could target, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're going to go after something exactly. that is totally not only not terribly consequential, but also completely treatable with over-the-counter supplements. Mm-hmm. Right? There are boxes and boxes of a product called lactate and generic versions of it that's just lactase. Mm-hmm. So why are you going to try and do gene therapy with all of its associated risks that hasn't really worked well in clinical trials to fix something that you can just, you know, yeah. not deal with? No, this is not what we want to do, Doug. We have ways if there's a medical need for something. And for gene therapy, you know, these are coming up. People are trying various things. And, you know, there's now a bunch of AAV vectors for hearing problems, blindness, going forward. These are and they're properly tested, not by a guy at home who's gonna take some dude on YouTube. I don't yeah. know what he did, but he certainly didn't make this virus and put it in pills and then. That's and, and there are, <laughs> I, I mean, there are there are people who complain about the slowness of the FDA process, and there are people, sometimes the same people, who complain about the unreliability of it. The dangerous things are sometimes approved, and we find out later that they're dangerous, and. A lot of folks don't really think about the fact that those two things are in tension with each other. Yep. Right. You can you can have it fast or you can have it good. <laughs> <laughs> now computers you can hack on because they're inanimate objects, right? Yes. But and, and it's you know a good example if you're hacking on a Raspberry Pi computer that you picked up for twenty bucks and and there's no consequence to messing it up, then that's fine. If you're um, hacking around experimentally on a computer that's used as a guidance system in a commercial airliner, that's not so cool. Yeah. And the biohacking thing is essentially, you know, hacking a computer on a commercial airliner that you're flying on. I make no doubt about it, Doug. Using viruses for therapeutic purposes is great, and you're yes. going to see a lot more of it. Man, it is amazing what's been done already, and the best is still to come. But it just needs to be done... You know, in a regulated fashion, as Alan said. Okay, that brings us to some picks of the week. These are called science picks of the week, but we can deviate from science. Alan, what do you have? Uh, What I have is a blog that I've been following for a little while now. Um, And uh, this is, uh, it's called In Season, but the site is uh, by a woman named Donna Long. She is a naturalist in, based in Philadelphia. Um, and I don't even remember how I initially stumbled on this, but uh, she's kind of a naturalist in the 19th century mold. <laughs> she does posts about keeping a keeping a field notebook in the traditional manner and uh, drawing and photographing birds and insects and identifying trees based on their bark in the winter time and just all this really cool stuff. And uh, I, I just I have this in my feed list and it. Uh, she updates it every week or two, and always with a post that I say, "Oh, that's cool." Nice bird pictures. Yes, very pretty. Yes, yeah, beautiful it, pictures. It's really cool, lovely. I don't see birds like this around. <laughs> well, you know, maybe you're not looking in the right places. Probably not looking at all. I should look out my window. And if yeah, it ain't, if it's not there, that's it, right? Right. <laughs> it's not on the feeder, which is going to be starlings and sparrows around here. Then I, I'm not going to see it. Uh, she yeah, a lot of squirrels. Looks. A lot of squirrels. Brianne, what do you have today? Um, I have an article from National Geographic, and it is related to a story that was in the news quite a bit yesterday. Um, I heard uh, a number of people talking about it, and it turns out that most of the reporting on the story had a bit of a problem. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So uh, there's a story about uh, Scott Kelly, who is an astronaut who was in space for about a year. Um, And he has an identical twin brother. Um, So there was a uh, set of experiments performed on the two of them. And it was reported yesterday that Scott Kelly um, had 7% of his DNA that was now different from his twin brother. Oh, man. (laughs) Um, And I had two different people burst into my office yesterday and say, did you hear about the changes in the DNA? (laughs) What does that mean about DNA repair, UV light in space and all sorts of things? Um, And I think that this National Geographic article explains the issue well. Um, So one thing that it points out is that most humans differ from one another by about 0.1% of DNA. Um, We differ from chimps 
by about 2% of DNA. So 7% <laughs> difference in DNA would, that be, would um, be big news. pretty remarkable. Um, but in fact, they didn't measure um, his genomic DNA. They actually measured gene expression yes. um, and looked at changes in how genes were expressed. So this is about transcription, not so much about DNA. Um, and there were big changes in gene expression, it seems, but not so much in the DNA. Um, and it seems like everybody got this wrong yesterday. Um, so, so if people so, want to know what happened, here it is. How, how did this start? Did we, do we know a, sp- a specific story that started this or did everybody get it wrong at once? Um, every person I spoke with yesterday, um, had heard of a different news source and they all, uh, mm. quoted the DNA issue. Mm. Yes. Too bad. Oh well, that's not surprising, right? Someone once no, said that it's science... not surprising at all. And <laughs> I when know. I when I saw this story, I was like, "Wait, what?" And I looked at it and I said, "You've got to be kidding me!" And then it kept popping up and popping up and popping up, and it's just been in the headlines for I don't know days. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. So the real question is, what seven percent transcriptional difference and what genes were involved? Do we know? Yeah. And so what? It- they didn't actually tell us. Um, they, sort of, <laughs> they mentioned sort of some pathways. Um, this is actually all based on a press release. They haven't released all of the data yet. Um, and they said that the 7% they now are referring to as space genes, but they don't tell us what these space genes are. Well, if, if I compared my transcripts with Dixon's, would I vary by 7%? Um, is that just a normal difference between people? Or is this really expressing an at all? So that you would, that, that's a great <laughs> question. I'm not sure I know off the top right. of my head. Depends but on who ate first. We'll have to look at the paper when it comes out. Sure. Exactly. I mean, it depends on activities and yes. food habits and all kinds of other things, right? Yes, exactly. But hopefully sure. the, the listeners uh, of TWIV will now know the correct story instead of the yes. wrong yes. story that's been going around. Exactly. Yes, thank you. That's, very, that's good. Ah. Dixon, what do you have for us? Well, I've got a kind of a self-serving pick this week, but it involves you too because it um, it it heralds the onset of availability of an online lecture series that we've been working on for the last six months, basically, and it takes our book Parasitic Diseases Sixth Edition, chapter by chapter, and turns it into a lecture presentation, I should say. And uh, you were the engineer and the uh, producer of those uh, lectures. And uh, Daniel Griffin and myself are the uh, presenters, and we're very proud of them. We welcome uh, people to look at them and to offer constructive criticisms. <laughs> and we will take them to heart and make changes accordingly, but it uh, took a long time to get them up, and Vincent's hard work persevered through weekends of late nights and <clears throat> all kinds of other uh, difficulties. And uh, finally, it's a, it's a reward to see these things finally go public. This is great. So we hope you enjoy them, and um, we hope you learn something from them as well. Comment here on YouTube. I just started to watch these videos. I'm already excited for them. Great. I had started listening to TWIP and TRIV recently when I was preparing for a parasitology exam and have not stopped. (laughs) (laughs) Hope these videos will be as good as the podcast. Yeah, well, we do too. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it was was an interesting project working with Dixon and Daniel. That was fun. It was a lot of fun. Done, 45 lectures a lot and i i I will say that dixon you know presents a lot of the biology and then daniel gives a case presentation which goes into the clinical aspects of each and talks about the treatment and the drug very good it's really nice yeah so i I don't think there's anything like it out there so well time will tell very useful very good great Mm -hmm. kathy what do you have uh First, I have to say that I was muted when you were talking about the Uh. 7% difference in (laughs) DNA. And um, what I wanted to say was that I totally missed it. And so I didn't even know about the story till I read it in the (laughs) the Google Doc here. But uh, evidently, because one of the two tweeted about it, one of the two twins, I think it was Scott, the astronaut, tweeted about it. That probably spread it pretty far yes. and wide is my guess. Yeah, right you're right. You're right. He said, look, my DNA is 7% difference. I mean, right. It's his fault. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they should have done it. With, well, they had to do it with them because they're twins. But, right. you know, Kate Rubens would have got it. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they should have asked her before they tweeted. Yeah. So oh, well. my pick, I'm going to do it a little bit like a, like a car talk puzzler or um, 
and <laughs> and or like your case things on Twit, but not quite because if people just go to the link, they can figure out why. But and this is kind of an old story, so you might already know. But in 1986, the American Physical Society's annual meeting was supposed to be in San Diego, but there were scheduling conflicts. So with only a couple of months to spare, they moved it to Las Vegas's MGM Grand. And it was an unmitigated disaster for the MGM Grand. Financially, it was the worst week they'd ever had. <laughs> After it was over, the uh, American Physical Society was politely asked to never come back. Not just by the MGM Grand, but by the entire city of Las Vegas. <laughs> so you can think about reasons why this might be. These are physicists. Um and then just go check out the link. And if we remember uh, when I'm back, we'll tell you uh, uh, <laughs> yes. what the reason was. It's oh, very, funny. It's very good. I'm guessing it's because, you know, the physicists partied so much, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Something. Okay. My <laughs> pick is a video that I put up this week. And Kathy asked it's, for way back, I don't know. Yeah, it's really ago, cool. And it's, it's called Bucky Ball Viruses. I just took a video of myself building a few of these magnetic things that I have on my desk. And it's four minutes long, which uh, is, should be um, short enough for everybody. It's highly amusing. Check yeah. Check it out. And I have so, to say, uh, so I had this um, helical buckyball <laughs> and a icosahedron. And the other day I thought, if I put the two together, I get two-pound virus. So here yeah. in my hand, I have a two-pound virus. And if you look at on Twitter today, you'll see this picture. And it's a, cool. it's a nice, it's good because the tail is big compared to the caption, right. which is the way it is in Tupon virus. It also right. looks like a sure SM-59. Or an aspergillus <laughs> that the Pope would use to sprinkle holy yeah, water. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Did you go to church as a kid? No, but I know what uh, an aspergillus is because aspergillum is named after it. Really? Oh. Yeah, that's right. Oh, well, cool. Because their ascospores look just like an aspergillum. We have a listener pick from Paul, our friend in Australia, the Twivians. Thanks for all your ongoing and enjoyable discussions on everything viral. Just finished listening to last week's podcast on the sting in a bat's interferon <laughs> response. Muggy here in Brisbane with a threat of cyclone Jesus. warning han hanging over us. Mm. Thought I would share some pics of a going away present. One of my recently graduated <gasps> PhD students Look. just gave me. Ashley Shannon is heading off to Marseille to work with Bruno Canar on her first postdoc, funded by an Endeavor Fellowship. I'm sure she'll have a great time there, particularly with the fantastic seafood. Right. Uh, Ash's PhD was looking at pathways to antiviral drug design targeting the West Nile virus protease. The labels on the two bottles of wine captured the essence of her PhD beautifully. How nice. I particularly like the description on the back of one describing the grape origins. The Forever Young reference on the front is a nod to the name my group adopted whenever we entered a team in the department's <laughs> social competition. This is what science is all about. Wonderful colleagues and lifelong friendships forged in the pursuit of discovery. Keep up that? the great work, Paul. Great. University of Queensland. So what does it say on the label here? Oh, I blew it up. This forever young wine has fermented for many years in the bowels of a UQ lab. Each grape was carefully selected, cloned, and amplified before <laughs> undergoing multiple rounds of mutagenesis to create this perfect blend. This young wine is the ideal elixir for grant writing. Well. Cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, you got a red and a white too. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. And Australia has wonderful wine growing regions. So yes, yeah, fantastic. Microbe.tv. slash twiv. Now I know most people just listen on the road, or and you can't look at show notes. I I understand that, but <laughs> if you ever want to, you can go to microbe.tv. slash twiv, and you can find all the show notes and links and pictures of seals and other things. Yep. Or, of course, if you just listen, you're going to be doing that on your phone or tablet, your app, your favorite app, and then just subscribe. We just ask you to subscribe and nothing more. And Nothing less either. Consider, no. <laughs> send us your questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv, and consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute for ways to do that. Dixon de Pommier is at parasiteswithoutborders.com check out his new video series our new series come on Vincent you're part of the team 
Well, producers are you? No, just Tower. Come on, a Tower. Okay, Tower. I need someone else to blame for this okay, besides you're myself. <laughs> you, but you're you're responsible for the content. Right? Yeah, that's true. That is true. But after listening to them about fifty times <laughs> exactly. during the editing, I got to learn a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Dixon. Thank you. Brian Barker is at Drew University and on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thank, thank you, you. Yes, thank and, you very much. I had a wonderful time. And I will see you tomorrow at a biology meeting, right? Yes, I will see you tomorrow. That's and true. hopefully uh, you will enjoy some of the research going on here. You'll be back in the future. I see you're on the calendar for, for some availability and we'll just pop you in whenever we need to be. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. I appreciate it. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com. He's on Twitter as Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM and Ronald Jenkins. RonaldJenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>